Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight. New scrutiny for Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government. You would have thought there was an adult in the room with the Prime Minister. The charity that received a sole source contract says members of the Trudeau family were paid to speak at its events. It's a pure witch hunt, it's a hoax. When it comes to his key financial records, Donald Trump gets a judicial split decision. It's another uh, blow to the industry. Quebec says you can still drink in bars, just not as late and no dancing. And on the field, one step closer to the dream. Well, one of the things I wanted to do when I got here is for sure open the roof. The Jays prepare to play in the summer of COVID. This is The National. A week after the Ethics Commissioner opened a file looking at the Prime Minister and a government contract to the WE charity, tonight we're learning details about ties between that organization and members of Justin Trudeau's family. The scrutiny began over the sole source contract to run a $900 million student summer grant program. We subsequently pulled out of the program and said it never paid an honorarium to Margaret Trudeau. Well, today that changed. Catherine Cullen starts us off tonight. I'm so proud to be a Canadian. I'm so proud to be part of WE. It's no secret Margaret Trudeau loves WE. She's appeared at event after event for them. Now WE, I love it the most because it is neither a political movement nor a religious one. And as questions roiled about Justin Trudeau's government giving a sole source contract to a charity the Prime Minister likes, we insisted the Prime Minister, his wife and mother were never paid. In an email on June 25th, we told CBC News the charity has never paid an honorarium to these individuals. But that's not true. Today, we said that through its sister company, Me to We, Margaret Trudeau received a quarter of a million dollars for a total of 28 events since 2016. And says the Prime Minister's brother, Alexandre Trudeau, received $32,000 for eight events. And we says that some of that money was actually paid directly from the charity, which it describes as a billing error. We revealed the information today, calling it a proactive disclosure. But in fact, news site Canada Land was preparing to publish invoices proving the transactions. So the truth was about to come out. And PMO confirms Sophie Grégoire Trudeau also once got a smaller honorarium from WE, $1,500 for an event back in 2012. As for the Prime Minister, he was already facing an ethics commissioner's investigation over awarding the sole source contract to WE to run a student grant program. You would have thought there was an adult in the room with the Prime Minister saying, hey, Justin, you cannot give a billion dollars to people that your family work for. There's even a call for him to temporarily step aside while the matter is investigated. This is such a huge uh, conflict of interest if it proves to be true that Canadians and Quebecers cannot go on with this prime minister. The prime minister's office put out a statement saying his relatives support causes of their own accord and that what is important to remember here is that this is about a charity supporting students. No answer on whether the Prime Minister knew about any of these payments. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. So what could the political consequences be for the Prime Minister? Good thing that issue is here again tonight. Rosie will have that a little later in the show. Now let's check in on Canada's fight against COVID-19. The number of new daily cases remains just over 300. Across the country, there are more than 27,000 active cases, most concentrated in Quebec, but new clusters are causing concern. PEI reported one new case today. After months with no new cases, it now has six. Quebec reported 137, the most in two weeks. And Ontario saw 170 new cases with 86 in the Windsor-Essex area where so many migrant workers live. Of course, today's snapshot tells us nothing of the months ahead. That is a big concern for parents forced to wonder in midsummer what school will look like in September. Well, Ontario has now made it clear it wants kids back in class all week. Deanna Sumanek Johnson shows us why it won't be easy. The province is planning for three scenarios, but for many parents, these words give hope. 
preference of the government continues to be everyday, day-to-day, -day, conventional in-class delivery, meaning students in class each and every day with heightened health and safety protocols. We need a plan that prioritizes and gets our kids back into school five days a week. What did you spell there? This parent and lawyer says staying home has not been good for the mental health of her young children and might be unsustainable. I think chaos is probably the optimal word. Um, it's been very difficult. So I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. I work full time uh, about 60 hours a week. Go, Lily. This mother of five, a city councillor, would also like to see her kids go back to school, but she says that scenario raises many red flags. Before you play with a parent's emotions, we should get that, all of these questions answered. One example. What will happen if one child uh, in the classroom has COVID in, in their home? And are we going to shut down the school? In a statement to CBC, a union president said, while we all want schools to be fully operational this September, the education minister has yet to demonstrate this is possible. There is inadequate funding for safety measures, no concrete plan, and health authorities and experts have yet to confirm it is safe to proceed. The lack of funding and space also concerns this school board trustee. As far as TDSB goes and my board, my schools are all at 100% capacity. So if we're going to have smaller cohorts and we're going to have everybody back at school, where are we going to put them? Questions that have yet to be answered as the province continues to keep its eye on numbers of new infections at a time when parents have to be ready for anything. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Montreal's legendary nightlife is about to be reined in just two weeks after Quebec bars were allowed to reopen. Starting tomorrow, they face some new restrictions. Alison Northcott shows us who is not happy. After being closed for months, this bar just reopened two weeks ago and they're trying to get back on their feet. It's another uh, blow to the industry. But the owner says new rules starting tomorrow make that harder. Now we are choking. And maybe there'll be a lot of people going belly up. There is a matter of public health that we need to do something. After an outbreak linked to two parties and a bar near Montreal, the province is restricting bar hours and capacity. I want to be more prudent than regret over the next few weeks or few months that we didn't do the right thing. Bars will have to stop serving alcohol at midnight instead of 3 a.m., reduce their capacity by half, and dancing will be forbidden because customers have to stay seated. There will also be an increased police presence around some bars and a voluntary registry of customers to make contact tracing easier if there's a case. We would want to make sure that there are no secondary uses of this information. Bars shouldn't be collecting information as a patron and after the health crisis is over saying, hey, this might be a great group to advertise to. So basically, the second someone comes in... This bar has already been closing early because the manager says some late night customers can forget public health rules. We're not looking for the type of clientele that doesn't care about what's happening. We're kind of trying to focus more on long term, um, you know, the, the customers that are going to really care about being careful. <laughs> Known to be crowded and loud, experts say bars are a perfect place for the virus to spread. It particularly loves mass indoor gatherings featuring people who are inebriated and perhaps not engaging in the best personal responsibility decisions. Quebec's health minister says he knows some bar owners are unhappy with the rules, but he says the alternative would be to shut them down. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Three more COVID-related deaths have been linked to a growing outbreak at an Edmonton hospital. So that brings the total number of deaths at the hospital to six, with more than 30 patients and staff also testing positive for the virus. The hospital has temporarily closed all services to incoming patients, including the emergency department. In Ontario, there is a growing call to expand how people can visit their relatives at long-term care homes. They can already visit outside, but the personal care they could give inside would ease the burden on the system and also their loved ones. Here's Ellen Morrow. This is the old picture you want to see. For the Shaw family, memories of a happy past distract just briefly from the painful present. Our visits definitely were what kept her together in terms of being happy and living um, a life worth living.
Those visits twice a day with their wife and mother ended by the lockdown. She called us and said, when did I become a prisoner? Even when she was working. The family says they're essential caregivers and they're desperate for the province to let them back in. There can be so many other things taken care of that us family members can do to that alleviate the home and give them a break. Dr. Jobin Varaghese agrees. He's the chief medical officer at Grace Manor, one of the first Ontario care homes where the military was deployed. There's a lot of different roles that caregivers and visitors and volunteers play that we're just missing. Varaghese knows the misery of COVID, but says isolation is devastating too. He wants the province to allow family caregivers in now, arguing it can be done safely. Whether it's uh, helping to encourage somebody to eat, uh, whether it's being a part of the ability to kind of calm a patient with dementia down, we're not ever going to be able to uh, replace a family member. But the province says not yet. The more people we, we bring in there, the, the, the chances go up. And then, uh, God forbid, something breaks out. And Neil Reddy is now allowed into his mother's home to help feed her, but only because she stopped eating and was starting to fade. I think the term pandemic prison has been coined. It's so apt. It's just sad to see uh, how far she's gone downhill. She's weak. Um, she's lost a lot of weight. Still, walking in to see her, Reddy knows he's lucky. It's the kind of quality time the Shahs are yearning for too. It's really saddening and I can only imagine what's, what she's feeling inside. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. In the U.S., the rate of new infections is still rising in 33 states. President Trump often claims that's because they're testing so much, but the rate of positive tests disproves that. A month ago, 4% of U.S. tests came back positive. As of today, that number has nearly doubled. In hotspots like Florida, tests now come back positive 19% of the time. In Arizona, it's now more than a quarter. The president had other things on his mind today, however. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled on who gets to see Trump's tax returns. While it was at least partially a legal loss for Trump, Katie Simpson shows us why it was a political win, too. Do you have a reaction to the Supreme Court rulings today, Mr. President? Uh, the president has mixed feelings on today's decisions, which may force him to hand over his tax returns to investigators, but not likely before the 2020 election. This is a political witch hunt, the likes of which nobody's ever seen before. It's a pure witch hunt. It's a hoax. In a 7-2 ruling, the court said prosecutors in New York can continue to pursue Donald Trump's personal financial records as they look into alleged hush money payments to women, including Stormy Daniels. Trump's lawyers argued that as president, he has immunity and doesn't have to cooperate. But Chief Justice John Roberts wrote, no citizen, not even the president, is categorically above the common duty to produce evidence when called upon in a criminal proceeding. The Supreme Court, including the president's appointees, have declared that he is not above the law. In a separate 7-2 to two decision, the court shot down a request by Democrats in Congress to obtain a wide swath of Trump's financial records. They can try again, but must narrow their scope. The public will not see his tax returns in 2020. That's a victory. That is something that was the uh, the calamity that was potentially at the end of this case for the president. Trump is the first modern presidential candidate not to release his tax returns. Democrats accuse him of having something to hide. Trump rejects that charge, previously saying it doesn't seem to bother the public. I, I won. I mean, I became president. No, I don't think they care at all. They, I don't think they care at all. The New York investigation now resumes. Prosecutors will again argue in a lower court to obtain Trump's financial records. Even if successful, the documents won't likely be made public unless charges are laid. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Donald Trump's former personal lawyer is back in jail tonight for refusing the conditions of his home confinement. Michael Cohen entered a Manhattan courthouse today but never came out. Just days ago, he and his wife ate at an outdoor restaurant near their home. That's where Cohen was supposed to serve his term after being released in May due to coronavirus concerns. 
Presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden laid out his vision for U.S. economic recovery in battleground state Pennsylvania. He called it the Build Back Better plan. This is our moment to imagine and to build a new American economy for our families and for our communities. Now, we don't know who Joe Biden's running mate will be for a little while yet, but in the current political climate, some of Biden's supporters told Paul Hunter what they'd like to see happen. Just steps from the White House, Washington's brand new Black Lives Matter Plaza is a stark reminder this is now a changed America. The death of George Floyd in May brought not only demonstrations, but in the eyes of many, an imperative now in Joe Biden's fight for the White House, that his pick for vice president must be not just a woman, but a black woman. On some level, I think there's a majority of people in this country are saying, we want racial healing. We want to see some equity. For Biden to achieve that, says Latasha Brown, co-founder of the group Black Voters Matter. Step one of that is nominating a black woman as vice president. Vice President Biden, you, you need, need us. us. You, you owe us. It's a message driven home in this video op-ed published in May. Indeed, among those in it, Latasha Brown. Your only path to victory is through black women. The voters you need to turn out, we know how to mobilize them. Don't forget, Biden long ago pledged a female nominee. I pick a woman to be vice president. But he's also long benefited from support within the U.S. black community. And in the suddenly new political landscape, the whole conversation has changed. There's no reason for him not to do this. Democratic strategist Yolanda Carraway emphasizes a black woman now would not only crucially energize black voters, but could bring real change on so many issues now confronting the U.S. If she has that portfolio, I mean, that portfolio about um, reforming the police department, I think it can make a huge difference. We will elect Joe Biden as the next That's president right. of the United States. California Senator Kamala Harris remains a favorite. Among the others, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, Congresswoman and former Florida Police Chief Val Demings, Georgia Democrat Stacey Abrams, and National Security Advisor to Barack Obama, Susan Rice. In whatever capacity I can serve to support Joe Biden and support this country, that's what I'm going to do. From the countless now pushing hard for one of those, the message for Joe Biden is clear. You have to know when it is the right moment. This is the moment. Will he make history? The decision will come this summer. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Here are some of the other stories we're following tonight. An Amber Alert has been issued for two sisters in Quebec, six-year-old Romy and 11-year-old Nora Carpentier. The suspect is their father, 44-year-old Martin Carpentier. Police say the three haven't been seen since the car they were riding in crashed last night about 70 kilometers west of Quebec City. The area was searched, but nothing's been found. Officials are urging the public to call 911 if they have any information. And a woman was killed north of Toronto in a bizarre accident when an SUV drove off a second-story parking deck and hit her. The driver of the vehicle also died. A passenger in the SUV was taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Being addicted to a controlled substance is not a crime and should not be treated as such. And Canada's police chiefs are calling for the decriminalization of personal drug use. The Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police say it is time to approach substance use as a health problem. The association's president says this would not only save lives, but would also allow police to focus on organized crime and drug trafficking. Millions of Canadians are still in the grips of a sweltering heat wave that just won't quit. Next on The National, why these temperatures aren't going anywhere. And the Jays are back on the field. The return of Major League Sports in Canada, sort of. We're going to try to make it as real as, as we can. And later, an emotional family reunion. We get our Hollywood. A community comes together to find a lost dog. We're back in two. Welcome back. A heat wave continues to tighten its grip in much of southern Ontario and Quebec. 
Widespread heat warnings remain in place across the two provinces, with the Humidex today felt like 42 at some point here in Toronto. Hot weather is expected to continue through the end of this week. And for more, let's bring in CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff in Vancouver. Firstly, Joe, welcome back. It hasn't been that hot out west, I gather, but, you know, over here, it's been like the sweltering couple of weeks. Do you have a sense of what's behind this sort of locked-in weather? Yeah, thanks, Adrian. The uh, driver behind all of this persistent extreme weather really is this locked jet stream. Normally, our jet stream sort of goes from west to east across the country acting as a conveyor belt for our systems but sometimes it meanders and gets stuck in place and that's what's happened here extreme heat and dry conditions in the east and here in the west we've seen very soggy and cool conditions leading to localized flooding and evacuation orders mudslides a big hit to the crops both in both in bc and alberta we've had over 140 percent of our average rainfall over the past couple of months and this pattern really has been in place since the start of june adrian so I gather some scientists too are saying, yes, climate change in this case might actually be a factor. There is a big connection now between a warming climate and this meandering jet stream. The jet stream gets its fuel from temperature differences between the north and the equator. And as the north warms so much faster than the rest of the world, uh, you can see here on this temperature map, uh, that gradient is shrinking. So the jet stream is getting less fuel and it's meandering and stalling out more. We've seen this happen in the past, but these blocking patterns are happening more frequently and they're sticking around for longer. At least with this one, Adrian, it looks like we'll get a bit of a break on both sides of the country this weekend. Always great to hear your insights. Thanks, Joe. A different heat wave is cause for some deep concern among climate scientists. This one in the Siberian Arctic has been going on for several weeks now. Chris Brown shows us how it could have implications for the rest of the world. A part of the world that usually epitomizes cold is now unseasonably very, very hot. Regions of northern Siberia are routinely 10 degrees higher than usual, often cracking 30 degrees. Yakutia is a cold, wintry place, she says. I didn't think it would ever get so hot here. The implications of the heat wave for Russia's landscape are already severe. 1.7 million hectares of forest and tundra are now on fire, including some areas that are less than 15 kilometers from the Arctic Ocean. This fire season seems to be quite extreme. Anton Beneslavsky is Greenpeace Russia's wildfire coordinator. So a lot of forests would be heavily damaged and destroyed. Canada's Arctic is of course heating up too as climate change alters the Gulf Stream current, propelling warmer air north. It's remarkable, scary. Tundra ecologist Greg Henry is usually up on Elmsmere Island about now, monitoring climate change but the pandemic has kept him back at UBC in Vancouver this season. The Arctic has accumulated an awful lot of carbon. In fact, the sort of best estimates we have now is about twice as much carbon in the soils of the Arctic than is in the atmosphere right now. We would be speeding it up if the fires got in there and started burning that, car that carbon that's been locked away for thousands of years. It's not just Russia's forests and air quality that suffered. This river turned crimson last month after 20,000 tons of diesel fuel leaked from a mining company reservoir. It appears thawing permafrost that held the containment area together melted. Greenpeace says government oversight is badly lacking as are measures to mitigate climate change. Uh, with a total lack of will to solve the problem brings us to the fire catastrophe every year. Though there was cooler weather this week, forecast models show fires continuing to spread. And this week's blip doesn't alter the projection for more extreme Arctic weather events as the region heats up twice as fast as the rest of the world. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. Ahead tonight, a big step forward this evening for the return of Major League Baseball. The Jays were back on the field in Toronto and they even played a game. We'll take you inside spring training during a pandemic. But up next, Rosie's here with that issue. Adrian, tonight we are, of course, going to take a closer look at the ties between the Prime Minister, his family, and the WE charity. Paid speaking engagements revealed today, and the Ethics Commissioner now looking into all of this, even before that was revealed. And, of course, the political damage. All of that next with me and the Ad Issue panel.
this is such a huge uh, conflict of interest if it proves to be true that Canadians and Quebecers cannot go on with this prime minister as the chief of state of Canada. Calls for the prime minister to step down tonight from the leader of the Bloc Québécois. This as controversy surrounding Justin Trudeau's ties to the WE charity continues to grow. We now know that several members of the Trudeau family were in fact paid to speak at some of the charity's events. So what are the political consequences for the government? It's Thursday, so we called back at issue for a second night in a row. We're going to do our viewer questions, but we'll put that off until next week because of this story. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Althea Raj is in Ottawa. We'll catch up with Andrew when we can. Uh, all right, let, let's just start with the news, uh, Chantal. How significant is this? Just a reminder to people, as I'm sure they saw in Catherine Cullen's story, that there was a large contract going to WE to help the government administer this student grant volunteer program. The, the, the contract has been severed, but in the meantime, this has now come to light today. Yes, and is, how much of a surprise could it be? Almost everything that has happened from that announcement on was almost written and predict, uh, easily to be predicted on the day when it happened. But to add to that, uh, today's news only makes something that stank, uh, stink a lot more. I believe it's a, a self-inflicted wound. It's a serious uh, story. And it goes to the issue that the opposition parties will uh, focus on, which is the judgment of the prime minister, mm -hmm. because this is uh, a controversy that is tied directly to himself. Yeah, I mean, so, so the ethics commissioner didn't even wait for this latest piece of information to be kept public to, to decide that he was launching an investigation into potential conflict of interest between the prime minister here. The prime minister said in a press conference this week, Althea, that he didn't recuse himself from the cabinet table when the contract decision was made. Uh, and, and now we find out that his mother, his brother, and on one occasion before he was prime minister, his wife all got money from this charity. Yeah, I mean, it stank before we got this kind of uh, bombshell story uh, today. Last Friday, I think the story was bad enough. Um, you don't, if you read the Conflict of Interest Act, you don't actually need to have uh, one of your family members, for example, get a financial benefit. A benefit can be in a promotional benefit, for example. Sophie Grégoire Trudeau has a podcast, and her, her brand, if you want to call it that, might be uh, heightened by the fact that she's given more exposure through the WE uh, organization. Mm -hmm. um, so he's basically... Uh, being investigated for breaking the conflict, of, being in a conflict of interest, uh, showing preferential treatment to an organization that he has ties with. I mean, I think the question that everybody is asking themselves is, you know, how could the prime minister's office have allowed this to go through? I mean, there are so many details surrounding this contract that doesn't even make sense. This organization is for young people. It's now it's administrating uh, volunteer opportunities for post-secondary students. Like that doesn't really make sense. Um, the questions about the fact that we was administrating the contract, but also it was offering paid government paid volunteer position with its own organization. Well, that seems a little shady. Uh, the fact that it was paying <laughs> teachers $12,000 to uh, recruit yeah. dozens and dozens of students to join this organization. Also, some people had problems with that. And now we, we learned that the financial ties are even more um, obvious than uh, perhaps many people suspected. I mean, you, you, you could, you know, you could, if you were the government, try to dissociate yourself from all those things that Althea just r r rhymed off there, Chantal, because you could perhaps say that it was the organization and you didn't know. It, I think it becomes, no. it, well, but, but perhaps, right? But I think uh, it becomes maybe. very, maybe, but it becomes very difficult <laughs> for a government to say, I didn't know my mom was making money from the organization. Like, I, I don't know how that would not have come up at any point. Uh, two points. If yeah. no one in the PMO raised his or her hand to say this is not a great idea because optics to start with are not so good. And even if you really want to do this, we need to do due diligence. And if that didn't happen, then Justin Trudeau needs to change his palace guard because they're not watching his back. If someone did raise his or her hand, 
and was ignored, and only one person can ignore that advice, and that would be the prime minister, then the prime minister needs to look at himself in the mirror and wonder whether his judgment, uh, once again, in this case, has failed him. Because anyone who is competent would have said, this, the optics of this will be difficult. Should we not do due diligence? Not so hard to do, apparently. Yeah, Althea, go ahead. No, I 100% agree with Chantal. I, the, the fact that he would not recuse himself from this decision, well, first of all, they suggested that this, uh, the WE charity was identified by the public service, which is, um, raises a lot of questions to begin with. It's very unusual. Even if this is the case, let's suspend disbelief. If this is the case, usually the public service comes to you with a few options, not one option. And rarely would the public service say, hey, we don't have the capacity to do this. We think you should go with another group. Even let's say we believe that that happened. The fact that the prime minister, who knows that he, his mother, his wife, his brother, uh, have ties to this organization, financial or otherwise, the fact that he would not recuse himself from that cabinet decision, that is a question of judgment. And I want yes. to say, you know, in the in the last ethics report, the Jody Wilson-Raybould uh, SNC-Lavalin uh, investigation, the PMO decided that they were going to uh, release cabinet confidences. They have set the bar. And so now... The opposition, I expect, will be all over the government about whether or not that standard is going to be met. I mean, this is not the parallel case. I think the parallel yeah. case is the Aga Khan report. Yes. But uh, that bar has been set now. And, you know, what discussions were happening around cabinet? Will Canadians know more about this? because they have set that bar so high now. So, Chantal, this is the third now investigation, the third time uh, questions of judgment have been gone in front of the ethics commissioner. How potentially damaging is this? And after that, i got to go. I'm going to add to that the blackface uh, episode and say that they, uh, I'm, I don't think we're going to go in an election over this. A billion dollars was on the table. That's a hell of a lot of money, by the way. Uh, but I do believe it weakens uh, Justin Trudeau's leadership position from inside the Liberal Party at this point. Okay. Thank you both. I will, again, try not to call until August, but at this point, who knows what will happen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to the Ad Issue podcast. Look for it on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash The National. And on that, I'll throw it back to Adrian in Toronto. All right. And next on The National, a site for sore eyes at the Rogers Centre. The Jays are back on the field, but spring training looks and sounds a little different this year. This was the message the Toronto Raptors delivered as they arrived today at Disney World in Orlando. Black Lives Matter. The images were part of a tweet that said silence is not an option. The defending NBA champions are preparing to resume the season July 30th. And the Toronto Blue Jays are back on home turf tonight playing an intra-squad game as they prepare for baseball's COVID-shortened season. But as Greg Ross tells us, where they end up playing that season... That's another matter. The crack of the bat. The pop of the mitt. Sounds we haven't heard at the Rogers Center for months. Manager Carlos Montoyo is doing his best to make things feel as normal as possible. Well, one of the things I wanted to do when I got here is for sure open the roof. That way you feel like you have some fresh air and so far it's working great. The team is still adjusting to its new reality, like media conferences over Zoom. You know, we're getting ready for a different kind of season two, no fans. It's, a, it's amazing to be doing a Zoom call with a player who is downstairs, and then you look up over your laptop and you're seeing the field behind you. Uh, uh, you, know, you can probably, 100 feet below us is where that player is. But it's Jays rookie infielder Austin Martin was talking to the media from his home in Florida when this happened. I think someone just rang my doorbell. So I'm going to go... <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Back here in Toronto, Martin's teammates played an inter squad game in front of an empty stadium, which is exactly the way real games will look when the season starts on July 23rd. The PA announcer is going to mention the guys' names when, when they come to hit. Uh, we're going to announce the moves. You know, we're going to have a music, you know, walk of music. Uh, we're going to have, you know, uh, 
fans noise you know we're gonna try to make it as as close to a real game that that we can do the team is also trying to create a life for players away from the field as they quarantine at the hotel attached to the stadium this will be home to the blue jays for at least the next two weeks but whether or not they play here beyond that is still up in the air they're waiting for approval from the federal government to be able to travel back and forth from the u.s and they also need the government's approval to allow other teams from the u.s to come here including teams that play in states like florida where COVID 19 cases are spiking greg ross cbc news toronto with the heat in most of central and eastern Canada, there may be less interest in baseball and more in your neighborhood pool. Here's what you need to know to keep safe. Summer's here, so pools have been figuring out how to reopen safely. So what should you expect? We're at a reduced capacity. Uh, we're at about operating at about 25%, and that's just to ensure that there is physical distancing. And that physical distancing will be important everywhere, from check-in to the change rooms, the locker rooms, and the pool itself. Now, at public pools, on top of the lifeguard, there may actually be a kind of COVID guard, someone whose sole responsibility is making sure that everyone keeps their distance from each other. But obviously, physical distancing doesn't apply to lifeguards saving lives. So don't worry, if you're in trouble, they'll still come get you. Beyond that, it's really going to depend on where you live and what kind of pool you're going to. High-touch surfaces like slides or diving boards might be off-limits altogether. Shared equipment like pool noodles and flutter boards might be out of service. And you may even have to book your swim time ahead of time, or as is the case with Toronto Public Pools. So in an effort to accommodate everybody, but also ensure the, the appropriate cleaning of facilities, we clear pools every 45 minutes, we clean them and turn them over for the next group. Now, a question that a lot of people will have is, can you get sick from the water itself? Well, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the answer is probably not. Now, that may be in part because of all of the chlorine in the pool, but also just because of how much water there is. The coronavirus would be so diluted. That being said, while you're having fun, maybe don't spit or blow your nose in the water. You can wear goggles if you like to protect your eyes, but just remember, if you get sick from being in a pool, it will very likely not have been because of the pool itself, but rather because you were too close to other people. Next, still recovering nearly a year after Hurricane Dorian. Okay, so this is one of our um, was a classroom and will continue to be a classroom. We'll take you to a school in the Bahamas where students are still learning and rebuilding their lives. Welcome back. Ten months ago, Hurricane Dorian tore through the Bahamas. Schools were destroyed, but when the pandemic hit, rebuilding efforts were put on hold. But they're still trying to get something ready for this fall. And as David Common first showed us in March, the desire to learn persists. Lift up your head to How do you make things seem normal when they're anything but? The national anthem to start the school day, sure. But the classroom is the teacher's home. Waving Let's try you again. What is today's day? The desk, a dining room table. The class, a fraction of what it once was. Okay, what about singular and plural nouns? What's a singular noun? To understand why, you need to step outside. Up the road where most students live or lived. Their neighborhoods largely leveled here on Great Abaco Island by last year's Hurricane Dorian. So many schools were destroyed, many kids have nowhere to go. There you go. Write your alphabets for me. Just practice writing your letters. There's your so teacher Katrinka Kwashi has opened up her own home. He was largely spared by the storm. But for so many other students left idle, the entire school year could be lost. They want to be in school. They want to be with their other uh, the students. This school has been a safe haven for these kids. It's not just school these kids have lost. One of their teachers, a Canadian, died in the storm. Alicia Leoli was from LaSalle, Ontario, just outside Windsor. 
She'd lived on Great Abaco for a few years, becoming immersed in life at the school called Every Child Counts, a haven for special needs kids. Meeting her fiance, the couple welcoming a son, and his mother, fallen in love with the island, choosing not just to remain, but to make a difference here. She was just a joy to be around. She really knew what she wanted to do out there. You know, and we're gonna definitely continue doing that in her honor. She was very driven and, you know, just very passionate. So this is where the primary school was. Um, Nicole Denarden worked alongside Alicia yes. and now helps oversee the reconstruction of the school. Okay, so this is one of our, um, was a classroom and will continue to be a classroom. Winds shaved the roof off of most of the buildings here, followed by surging water which filled classrooms to the ceiling. A tremendous loss, though rebuilding provides an opportunity. It feels like a blank slate that we can really make it the way we want to. Um, and knowing that it's coming back for our kids means a lot. So it's, it's, I'm glad to be here. You can feel some hope in the yes. aftermath of a tragedy. Yes, I'm really happy to be here. Run by Alicia Leoli, it leads students into a brighter, more independent future. It's not just about restoring the school, but also resurrecting Alicia's project. Her passion for the program evident in this school video featuring her. The support we've received from the community thus far has been absolutely outstanding. We a transitional really program for developmentally challenged adults, giving them a place to live and employment. In the end, there's a place for everyone, there's a job for everybody. Alicia was part of that, it was her passion, you know, kind of be the end goal for providing a home, providing a space that is their own, you know, independent living. So, this would have been somewhere for people to live. Yes. Progress is steady, yes. thanks to an okay. army of volunteer builders. Though the school still needs money to finish, it's a big task. Try to shorter ones first. The aim is to have these students and all those displaced by Dorian able to return in the fall, what will be a year since the hurricane's destructive impact. David Common, CBC News, Marsh Harbor in the Bahamas. After days of searching, a BC couple had nearly given up hope of ever finding their dog. We were in the car and my husband said, you know, this isn't Hollywood. It's not like the dog may just be in the middle of the road and come running towards us. In this wild landscape, a moment made for Hollywood is next. After going missing for three days and crossing a treacherous river three times, Jasper the dog is home, his re-entrance fit for Hollywood. So his BC owners were starting to lose hope, thinking Jasper may have drowned. Not many dogs could survive crossing the Columbia River even once. But all of a sudden, there he was, a reunion that is our moment. We were in the car and my husband said, you know, this isn't Hollywood. It's not like the dog may just be in the middle of the road and come running towards us. And um, probably like 60 seconds later, here's this dog. Unbelievable, Jaspi. Hey, we get our Hollywood. Running towards us. And he couldn't run that fast because his, his paws were all chafed in between, but he came running towards us. So yeah, we got Hollywood. I swear he must have had like 50 guardian angels around him because there's no way he could have made it. Nobody can swim in Columbia. Get our Hollywood. Okay, we were just saying we wouldn't get Hollywood. No. <laughs> so maybe you're thinking, how they get that footage? Well, it seems that they'd been asking for help, and someone from a nearby town had said, "Hey, I have a drone." They were out with the drone, but they hadn't found him. They thought we're going to pack it in for the night. When out he came from the woods. That is a national for July 9th. Good night. <laughs>